Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, again, hi everybody and good evening. And I'm gonna go uh, start over with an overview of, of Office of Law Enforcement. Um, when you think of the Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement, you don't think of us as being a small entity, but we are a small entity within a greater um, breadth of the whole of government and the Fish and Wildlife altogether. So I wanted to, to give you an idea of, of the Office of Law Enforcement and we'll go from there. So I'm gonna share my screen. And so the Office of Law Enforcement comprises of two entities within the, um, we're part of the Fish and Wildlife Service and we're and there's two law enforcement agencies in the Fish and Wildlife Service. One is the Refuge Law Enforcement, and, and we the other is the Office of Law Enforcement. The difference is the Refuge Law Enforcement officers are pretty much bound to refuges, and that's where their jurisdiction is. And that's not saying that they can't do investigations outside of the, the refuge, but that's primarily our purview, and we coordinate with them if they need to go outside the bounds of the refuge. And within the Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement, there's two programs, the criminal investigators, special agents, and the wildlife inspectors who are at the ports of entries in select ports in the United States um, to inspect wildlife shipments. The mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement is similar to the mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service. However, it's more about enforcement. So for us, it's to protect the wildlife and plant resources through the effective enforcement of federal laws. We contribute to Fish and Wildlife Service efforts to recover endangered species, conserve migratory birds, preserve wildlife habitat, safeguard fisheries, combat invasive species, and promote international wildlife conservation. So that's a large breadth for such a small agency of, of everything that we do. And we try to do this as we're supporting the efforts of the Fish and Wildlife Service and also other agencies within the federal government, including USDA, CDC, um, FDA, and all that other stuff too, that, that we and wildlife um, try to help out with. So the Office of Law Enforcement has Criminal Investigators Program, Wildlife Inspection Program, the National Fish and Wildlife Forensics Lab, the Digital Recovery and Support Unit, the Wildlife Intelligence Unit, the Branch of Training, International Operations Unit, and Special Investigations Unit. And I'll go further into what these, these are. The, but the, the, basically the Criminal Investigations Program is the Special Agents, and uh, the Wildlife Inspection Program is inspectors who are uniformed. And these are the statutes that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service is authorized to enforce um, the Lacey Act, which is unique in the United States. Um, it, it has a greater uh, breadth of enforcement than most other agencies' uh, laws. And a lot of countries, I, I'm gonna say a lot because I don't know if they've changed because they a lot of countries now look at the Lacey Act as a premier law that they're trying to enact in other countries and based on, on our rules. But basically the Lacey Act allows us to go after anybody who commercializes or illegally, illegally obtain an, a wildlife in violation of any law, domestic, state, or foreign within the jurisdiction of the United States. So we enforce other countries' laws within the United States with this law. And then you guys all know about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is the primary act that protects all birds in the United States, uh, migratory birds in the United States, a treaty between um, Japan, Russia, Canada, Mexico. Um, basically, virtually all migratory birds are protected on, under this um, law. The bird, Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp Act, which um, is an act when if you're a, a hunter, a migratory bird hunter, you know that stamp is required. For, for hunting, and that um, provides money to uh, promote the hunting and also the conservation and the conservation refuge areas and, and all that with the states to, to make this possible and sustainable. 
the Bald and Eagle Protection Act, which is basically bald eagles, bald and golden eagles, Airborne Hunting Act, which helps um, a fair chase uh, idea of not uh, using scaring animals or, or practices that would you wouldn't be normally used to have a fair chase with an animal. You can't shoot an animal from an airplane just because they can't evade a plane. Um, the Endangered Species Act, you always should know about. The Wild Bird Conservation Act is a lesser loan law, but basically protects any wild bird um, from being imported illegally. Um, Rhino Tiger Conservation Act, um, that's self explanatory. So is the African Elephant Conservation Act, uh, Fish and Wildlife Recreation Act, the Refuge System Act, and Marine Mammal Protection Act, which um, we share with NOAA. We basically do um, a few of species of marine mammals. Um, that's a walrus because it's ivory producing and sea otters for us and the rest basically goes to um, NOAA and I think manatee is us too. Um, Ar Archaeological Resources Protection Act, um, self-explanatory, Antarctic Conservation Act, and recently the Indian Arts and Crafts Act which we are taking over from another agency. But that um, one protects Native Americans and Indigenous Americans livelihoods by um, going after false uh, claims from, from sellers saying that their items are made by Native Americans. Um, recently, um, if you guys look into some of the press releases on this is that uh, a lot of the items coming in from the Philippines, being made in the Philippines, sold in the US, is being um, labeled or purported to be made from Native Americans, which they're not. And that takes livelihoods out of Native American policies. Um, so the criminal investigation and special agents and what we are, we're plain closed investigators. Um, this number is, goes up and down with retirements right now, but we're at the lowest point ever. So approximately 227 agents worldwide. If you look at just the Baltimore um, Customs port, they may have 400 employees in that one port, but we have 227 worldwide, just to give you, um, give you a number of how many we are. And this, this includes uh, administrators like me, who have supervisors and headquarters people. So it's not just all the field people. We do uh, we do overt and undercover investigations. We do ta transnational organized crime, wildlife trafficking investigations, um, endangered species investigations, all the stuff that other agencies can't do or are not in their purview. And here you see Vinyl Horn, a big case we had this um, gearing up with our partners. Uh, state partners in arresting people and taking in evidence. Our office locations, we have at least one office in every state, sometimes multiple states. Um, but here in Northeast is Region 5, Legacy Region 5, they renamed it. But basically Northeast stands from Virginia all the way up to Maine and what I cover uh, is West Virginia, Delaware, um, Maryland, and Virginia. And we also have, um, go to Hawaii and also have uh, an agent in Guam to help the Pacific Islands area. We also conducted uh, domestic investigations as you guys have heard, may have heard about the Elvers, which is uh, live baby eels being trafficked across um, to China to be grown up for um, food. And they illegally purchase or, or, or harvest these and then um, illegally ship them out to China to be grown and then coming back in as finished product and grown in China. Uh, these are live shipments of probably turtles uh, for to China be growing up, being shipped around the world for food. Of course, there's ivory um, here. Uh, we also do um, endangered species patrol. This is the manatee. 
that was um, as you if you've been to Florida, there there's manatee zones where there's no wake allowed, and some people go through there. And this is one of the things that we look into is the the boat strike boat strikes and kills of manatees. We do hunting violations. Um, of course, there's endangered species and um, invasive species like Florida. They have the the Burmese python, which is an invasive species. We help with that. And the bottom left picture, I don't know if it's reversed on you or not, where you see a baby crib. That was actually one of my cases that um, I helped out with where someone had purchased pygmy rattlesnakes and left them in the baby's room to breed. That's the type of people that we, we, we get who, and, and the guy was actually afraid of snakes. So I don't know why he got pygmy rattlesnakes to breed and sell, but they, that's commercialization. Um, baby alligators are a big thing too. They don't realize that uh, they're cute when they're little, but when they get big, they don't know where to put them and then they get in their trouble. That's also illegal in most states that to have um, crocodilians. Our international operations, and you can see here that the pangolin is one now becoming the most trafficked mammal in the world, just for the belief that their um, false belief that their scales actually are medicinal, which they're not. Same same thing with rhino horn, where it's it's all purported to be medicinal, but there there's nothing that's medicinal about them. Um, the other um, picture on the upper left here is a totoaba. Have you heard of that? It's a fish in the Mexican waters where the vaquita uh, dolphins, the smallest dolphin in the world in the Gulf of Mexico is, is now down to about 13 left in the wild and they're being extinct because of, of the fisheries for this um, fish bladder. It, it's being sold to China and the only fish that has this big fish bladder is the totoaba and it's being caught and in nets in which the uh, vaquita get trapped in and they die. Uh, vaquitas are notoriously uh, shy and very, get stressed very easy and they get heart attacks and die quickly once they're trapped. And then there's the sea turtles, IRB of course, and here's someone, someone smuggling birds in on tape to their body, snakes, uh, the snakes were in a speaker being smuggled in to the country. This our special investigation unit is the uh, major crimes unit for for Office of Law Enforcement. They focus on bigger targets, uh, organizations having the greatest and far reaching negative impacts on wildlife resources. Um, with this unit, they they go above and beyond. It's a long uh, process and and gathering of information to target the the bigger entities. This is a, the group that really targets uh, upper level, sometimes um, people are associated with other governments um, higher up in the chain, food chain. So we want to stop the corruption and the trafficking at the highest level possible. And this unit does that for us. Um, the wildlife inspectors. Uh, we have 139 wildlife inspectors right now. Um, we have six K9 teams. Uh, three of them are vacant because they've been retired. Um, 16 supervisory wildlife inspectors, three senior wildlife inspectors are in a headquarters unit, which helps with the coordination with other countries, the permits and um, validation. And right now we have two regional senior wildlife inspectors who uh, are over uh, char in charge of the regional ports. Uh, say in region five, we have JFK, Baltimore, Dulles, Norfolk, um, Maine, border, all that stuff. They're in charge of those, um, those ports of entry. And the main duties of the wildlife inspectors are to facilitate the legal trade of, of wildlife trade because there is a legal trade. We don't want to stop that. We just want to stop the illegal trade. Um, and we work along on customs and border protection and a border, we have border search authority and the force of regulations of 
the Fish and Wildlife and international treaties and laws. And their role in interdiction of smuggled wildlife is very important. They are the they are actually the front lines of of interdicting wildlife shipments. So while we are the investigating side of getting the criminals to court, they discover it and they pass it on to us. And they work with a number of border search agencies and have respect from the border search agencies because they know what they're looking at. Um, being an inspector, I know nobody knows everything and nobody can know everything, the difference between every species of, of wildlife out there. The wildlife inspectors are very keen on what, what they are and how to distinguish different species. And if they don't, they get the experts to, to tell them or show them how to, how to distinguish them. Um, one instance, when I was in uh, California, there was uh, alligator lizards and one of our inspectors actually did her PhD on a, the alligator lizards and she actually looked at alligator lizards species and counted the scales out to determine that that species wasn't the declared species that they were looking at. So um, wildlife inspectors are very important and, and there are eyes and ears and also very knowledgeable and they're respected by everybody who work with them to distinguish the different forms of wildlife that comes in from trophy shipments to dead animals to live animals and also you know all the diseases that come with those animals. So the Office of Law Enforcement and Wildlife Inspection Ports, there's all of them all over the world. We have few in uh, the borders of Mexico and these are just the designated ports. There's other ports that aren't designated that uh, they were covered. There's plenty of that's not designated, but the designated ports are the main ports of entry that are required to, for all animals to come into the United States, the wildlife to the United States. Uh, we only do wildlife, no domestic dogs, no domestic cats, no no guinea pigs or, or peach face lovebirds, stuff like that, which are considered domesticate now, but we only do wildlife. Um, we also have an international operations unit that was, uh, was started in probably 26, 2014, 2015, has grown to um, other countries. We had one, the first one started in Beijing and I grew up from there and then Bangkok. Um, we have several in Africa, Gabon, South Africa, Tanzania, Kenya. We were gonna get one in Germany to um, to help open the Northern Sahara area of Africa, but that didn't go through as of yet. We have one in Mexico City, Lima, Peru, and Brazil. And uh, Vietnam is the other one that came on board. And they are basically helping us in the countries um, with their wildlife trafficking issues and investigations. And they actually work under the um, the ambassador of that country for that area. The National Fish and Wildlife Forensics Laboratory. Um, I, I think everybody should know about this lab. You don't already. We we were at one point uh, recent, until recently, the only forensics lab in the world that were dedicated to crimes against wildlife. Um, we have a chemistry unit that does all the uh, investigation, determination of poisoning, pesticides, and trace evidence, a criminalistics unit to do all the latent prints and ballistics and um, cause of death and stuff like that. A uh, genetics unit that IDs animals with the ID of the animal can, uh, that's so good that we can get a gut pile somewhere, ID the, get the DNA and get the meat from somebody that we think is illegal and identify that the animal is that animal. The morpho morphology unit ID species by its morphology features characteristics and the pathology unit you know, cause of death for um, stuff that we don't see, whether it's uh, how it died, whether it was killed by, you know, striking and uh, by turbine or was it killed by pesticide or was it killed by natural causes, because that's also important. 
the one thing about the the lab, it is also now the CITES lab for for tree uh, ID and site tree um, identification for for the CITES, the Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species con, um, Group. And we're working with the USDA also to to um, ID timber for illegal logging cases. Our next unit is the digital evidence recovery unit, uh, technical support unit. This unit helps us with, our, uh, as you know, they're becoming more digital as the time goes by and we need the expertise to, um, to look at the evidence from computers, phones, emails, or many other stuff. And they also help us go when we do search warrants to uh, image computers so we can uh, take the data from that computer and not have to take someone else's computer. And it takes a while to do, and it's also kind of um, really, really technical with, with the passwords and getting around password and stuff. So we need those expertise and they have to get uh, certification every year to get uh, to do what they do. Uh, the Wildlife Intelligence Unit, this is uh, started in 2016. This is to help us use our, our resources and our partner resources to do analysis and also to help us with our resources to best handle a situation to achieve the mission. The branch of training, which is located in Georgia at the Federal Law Enforcement uh, Training Center, is a provides basic training to new OLE staff, and wildlife inspectors, uh, special agents, and support training requests from the field. They also do um, requests to train internationally at the International Law Enforcement Academy, which is ILEA, held in around the world and around the country. They've also um, produced training in the U.S. for bringing international conservation chiefs to the National Conservation Training Center in West Virginia to um, expose them to collaboratively work together. Because most of the time, these guys don't work together because they're in different countries. When they come here, we get them to work together, and they have a network of of of, of peers to work across borders easier and maybe get information easier. So the, the branch of training does an important job of providing training to us and also to the rest of the world who, who wants that for wildlife trafficking. And, and we also do wildlife ID classes and crime ID classes. Uh, the National uh, Eagle Repository, which is located in uh, Denver, this is the repository that houses all our seized items. Um, you can go on the website and take a virtual tour if you want to of, of the facility. Um, it's getting packed with all the stuff that we've had. That you've seen any um, TV shows of wildlife crime, they usually go to the lab and you'll see, I mean, the repository and see all the stuff that we have. We have rows of tigers that were seized. And these give, are open to anybody who wants to study these also similar to, to you guys who have field people come in and study um, animals and, and carcasses. You can go there and study that too. The, the, the repository is also sort of the second function is where it receives eagles by, by law, all eagles found that aren't um, contaminated or doesn't pose a threat to people those that have been poisoned, we wouldn't give that people, but they are a repository for eagles so they, um, they can be provided to Native Americans for their cultural and religious purposes rather than having them go and hunt and kill eagles. Um, we, the, the National Eagle Wildlife Repository also loans property to other offices uh, and governments. And, and if the Maryland Society wanted, Historic Society wanted um, to have items from the lab to be shown. They can, do, you guys can do that. You can also have what's called a suitcase of a survival where you need to go and take training and how, how to present the items to the group. And you have to sign off for that and you're responsible for that. And you have a suitcase of endangered species that you can show in your, in, in your 
educational realm. So what is a wildlife trafficking? Wildlife trafficking is illegal trade in wildlife and wildlife products. Um, as of last year, I believe it's still the third or fourth uh, major crimes worldwide under after um, illegal drugs, human trafficking, and I forget the third one. I think, I forget the third one is, but maybe monetary crimes. So it's a huge deal. Why is international wildlife tra trafficking important? It, wildlife trafficking has become a, a, a component of organized criminal activity where um, they sell these items or buy these items and traffic money through these under um, organized crime uh, activities and groups. Um, in West Africa, especially the ivory sales is, 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 is purported to be the financing of these militias and these groups in, in West Africa. Um, it affects the whole entire ecosystem. Um, when in this case, live, live corals are moved from, from Lingon Reef, destroy the habitat, destroy the livelihood of people who depend on the reefs for food. You know, the livelihoods uh, drive species and extinctions. You know, the poached rhino horns. Um, it's sad to say that the last white, northern white rhino was killed in the wild a few years ago, elephants for the ivory. And it also undermines the, the legal, um, legal harvest of plants and animals. It, it doesn't allow, when, when, when wildlife trafficking happens, it takes a, the money away from the government and the people who rely on them just for their livelihood to survive. And when you do this, you undermine any government um, program to help people come out of this uh, poverty level that they have over there. And it's mostly from these areas where um, these animals are desired, plants or animals are desired from richer nations. And the people who, who go and take these animals are poor and don't really have anything else to do or, or to, to make their livelihoods. And the money doesn't go, like we pay $200 for a plant, the person who picked the plant may have even gotten the 50 cents. That doesn't really help them. We don't do the legal way. At least we can do the legal way. We can do a fair, more of fair trade with, with people and, and produce a livelihood and make sure that uh, their harvest is sustainable. So that's number five. Oops. And it impacts other sustainable industries such as ecotourism is becoming uh, more and more prevalent and more and more of a way to, to protect animals, produce income for people. Another thing we need to talk about is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, which we work a lot with. And it's, it's in, in the US, it's a treaty that's under the Endangered Species Act. It's not a law in itself, it's a, it's a law it's a treaty under a law where in other countries, they believe uh, they treat it as a law where we don't treat it as a law versus it's a treaty under a law. So it, everything that comes in is enacted, the CITES is enacted under the Endangered Species Act. So the, the power of the Endangered Species Act is behind the CITES. So um, one thing to note, if and they, if an animal is on a CITES list, CITES 1, 2, or 3, the protection of the highest is CITES 1, then CITES 2 and CITES 3 is the least um, order of protection status. If it's on a CITES appendix 1, 2, or 3, it does not mean it's an endangered species and vice versa. There's two different uh, rules. So CITES only works on import and doesn't work within the United States. Just to, that distinction. Um, when people talk about society, it's not the same thing as endangered. So this uh, CITES is uh, managed under the management authority, um, which has a 
the division of management authority and the scientific authority, which is needed to to make the studies work in the United States and other countries. The convention is internet is international treaty, which almost every country in the world is now a party to. Um, I think maybe two or three countries are not party to it, but there are observers. Um, it, its aim is not to stop the trade, it is to protect trade. So just because it's on CITES, what it means is it's, it's, it's a way of legally trading in things. It's not a mechanism to stop trade. That's not what CITES does. So for the US, um, we have under the Endangered Species Act is a is a statute, and then we have CFRs, which is the Code of Federal Regulations. So it, it further defines what's needed under the Endangered Species Act. If you were to import into the United States, you would have to declare all wildlife to the to the Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's on the form 3-177, which is the Declaration for Importation, Importation or Exportation of Fish or Wildlife, which you see here. And all this information is basically what's included in the CITES document, but it goes further for us so that we can manage it. And we have a database that we can search and, and see if it's legally imported or not. Um, so every wildlife that comes in the United States, whether it's live or dead, needs to be reported to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. If you have a piece of coral you pick on the beach in, in Panama, you're you're supposed to declare it to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And you have to have permits too that go along with that. If you pick it coral, corals are protected CITES too. You need a CITES permit. If you don't have that, it's illegal. Um, and that includes personal use, but for commercial, if you were dealing with animals and wildlife, you need a import export license from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And your declaration process is the same but you're gonna go under more scrutiny because you're gonna have more, um, more things we're gonna probably look at than a personal import. So live or dead parts, everything wildlife needs to be declared to the Fish and Wildlife Service. If it's not, then it's illegal. If we don't clear it, it's illegal. So these are typical species that are, um, traded normally, um, uh, furs, bobcats, lynx, wolves, coyotes sometimes, rattlesnakes, plants, ginseng, caviar. Um, I don't know if you guys know that paddlefish caviar is becoming more and more um, of a thing and more because all the uh, sturgeon species are being depleted. So people are looking at, at paddlefish as uh, a substitute and the fish itself is not consumed, uh, it doesn't taste great. And also it, it feeds on by filtering. So it doesn't grow very big, very long. It's a slow grower. And of course, alligators and crocodile pelts, skins, elbers, um, sometimes across the borders, Native Americans can cross the border Sometimes they don't uh, cross with the correct permits or um, people who are purported to be Native Americans have these items and they're not Native Americans. They're not allowed to have these items or they sell these items, which you can't, you can't commercialize in. Even if you have a permit to have it, the Native Americans, you can't sell them. Um, turtles, of course, you guys all know are, are a big commodity all over the world, especially in the US, shark fins, um, ivory, of course. And this is a, just a synopsis of, of what we've done in 2019, the 2020 and 2021 would, wouldn't, is, isn't a good, I didn't want to show that because it's the COVID thing and the trade it kind of petered a little bit, but not too much. But this is the, the stats that we have for 2019 and, and we processed 191,492 declared shipments of wildlife and wildlife products worth more than 
$1.3 billion. That's just the stuff that's declared to us. It's not the overall shipment of everything else. And these are the, um, we track the investigations and the cases by the statutes. So you see what's here, 30 Elephant uh, Conservation Act violations, Eagle Protection Act violations, 50, 150 endangered species, 6,256 Lacey Act violations, 1,656 Marine Mammal Protection Act, 177 Migrant Bird Treaty Acts, 408 other federal law or foreign law, 558, the Minor Tiger Acts, 42, Wild Bird Conservation Acts, 58. And for that year, we did 9,344 investigations. These are federal partners we work with, Department of State. Uh, of course, we, uh, we do a lot of work with them with the attache program and also other programs that uh, International Law Enforcement Training Academy is run by them. Um, Department of Justice, of course, we can't prosecute cases, only attorneys can prosecute cases, so attorneys work with them a lot. FBI, DEA, NOAA, and Homeland Security with HSI and uh, CBP, and, and many other partners and state partners. And that is it for the presentation. Um, if you want to know more, please log on to our website, uh, www.fws.gov. And you can look on that for all of Fish and Wildlife. You look on the left-hand side of that page on the, on the uh, panel, gray panel, you click on law enforcement, and it'll have uh, Fish, and, uh, Fish and Wildlife Refuge offices, Officers and Office and Law Enforcement. Click on both if you want to see both, but office law, law enforcement is there. All our laws are there. All our press releases are there. And uh, our contact information is there too if you need it. Thank you so much. You can unshare. We can come back together and maybe take some questions. OK. Thank you. Wow. So much um, going on all over the world. Uh, do we have any questions? I, I know that there was a recent um, case that uh, uh, it was a, a large scale case. Uh, it was a turtle. Um, could you go over that and, and what went into that? It was a, a syndicate. Right. Um, that case, I, I believe this is the case you're talking about, the big uh, terrapin case in New Jersey. That case was started by uh, wildlife inspectors, of course, and it turned out to be a series of communications, undercover communications with the seller and, and from China and also all the US. What happened was the seller, the buyer in Hong Kong would, would contract or get students who are here from China to learn to ship uh, wildlife to him. And one of our agents got in and, and befriended the person and um, ordered and supplied him with turtles. And the main, the main the main scheme of that was to get foreign Chinese students who didn't know any better in the United States to ship these over to him. And then we had one or two that got convicted and were flipped so that um, he would tell us what they were doing and how they were doing it. So the easiest, I don't know, um, the easiest, way to do that was to ship it to the mail system because the mail system was is is was the the least um the least controlled at that time for export import it was easy to declare what you what you wanted in the mail system and put it in a box and it goes along because export wasn't really a, a a thing to look at in in the united states we do look at it but it wasn't a main import thing because we were concerned about things coming in 
and and harming the the U.S. domestic wildlife versus going out. But uh, more and more, we discovered that a lot of these shipments that were being seized were box turtles, were uh, bog turtles, were snapping turtles, um, radio sliders even, that were going out of the country. And then um, because the price for these domestically were so small, you can buy a huge amount and sell them from more over in China. The, I think that Diamondback Terrapin in, in China were going for 450 to $500 a piece, where in the US, if you were buying them, they were probably 24, if that, dollars a piece for a small species. So they were also going to collect, um, illegally, illegally collecting these by other um, US citizens who were, who were doing this to sell to him, knowing that uh, they would get a bigger chunk if they provided more to him, and that's how we got these large amounts of of, of turtles going going out of the country and being seized um, by our agent. Thank you, uh, Paul. You have a question you want to unmute and ask? Yeah, I was going to ask about uh, so your uh, international operations unit slide. Um, you said, you know, there's the, on the, on the map, there's, they're kind of sprinkled in places. So, and then you made a, you made a comment about, you know, you were going to, or there was some plan to have like a North Africa unit or something like that. So if, if, if there isn't a unit in that particular area, does that mean we don't have any, uh, collaboration with those countries? You know, like, no. I'm just going to throw a, a country out there, Egypt, right? So does that mean that, that we won't process uh, based on Egyptian law or anything else that's happening in or uh, related to Egypt or surrounding countries if the unit isn't uh, established? No, um, we, we will enforce any wildlife law that we can. Mm -hmm. if, it, if, it, if it violates an Egyptian law, we know about it. We yep. will use a Lacey Act to um, enforce the Egypt's law. It's say okay. Egypt requires a permit that for the turtle or tortoise or lizard that we're importing. Yeah. If they didn't come with that permit, we can we can seize it and use Egyptian law right. as a basis for seizure. Yes, we can do okay. that. Can I have a follow-up question uh, to that? So what if it's a criminal organization that's based in Egypt that's following Egypt law? If they're following a law. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't see okay. the violation. All right. So you're, answer, you're answering a question, and, and honestly, this is all coming from uh, recent events. Like there's, there's been a huge import of Libyan uh, tortoises recently, and uh, they are coming through Egypt, uh, legally through Egypt, but they're coming through criminal organizations in Egypt that have actually paid for the permits. Uh, so from, uh, from Egyptian law perspective, there, there's nothing illegal. So I would assume in those cases, there's nothing to investigate from a US perspective. I would say there's nothing, but um, at, with, with the fact pattern you laid out, mm -hmm. yes, they're, if they are legally getting these, these documents are legal, and yeah. no matter how they obtain them, they're yeah. legal documents, we, they would be legal. So and if, we can, yeah. if we can have investigators prove that these, these permits were illegally obtained, hmm. unlawfully obtained, yep. we may have an, a bigger investigation on that point. But it, the original question was, would we act on it, whether we had an attache or not? Yes, we would. Okay. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Heidi, you have a question. You can unmute. Uh, yes. I. It's not really a question. It's more of just an information to let everyone in Maryland know that we are bringing up the wildlife trafficking prevention bills again in both the House of Delegates and the Maryland Senate. We've been trying for years to get some type of wildlife trafficking prevention passed in Maryland. We don't have the Senate bill number yet. The House bill is HB 52. And so we're just, we're really hoping to get this passed because even though the federal laws have been strengthened you know, since President Obama did his task force, that does not affect the state laws whatsoever. So we're hoping that this will be a companion piece with the federal, you know, 
with everything that the federal authorities are doing, if we can have some something in Maryland to put some teeth in that too, then that that would just you know even enhance those laws even more. Thank you for that. And if you wouldn't send me some information um, on uh, email, uh, maybe we can uh, work together on that. Oh yeah, that Thank would you. I would I would love to do that. What I don't know your email address though. I'm going to do it. Be, I'm putting it in the chat. Be strong at MarylandNature.org. Okay, and I can. I mean, I can put my email in the chat too. Yeah, great. Okay, because I'm always willing. I'm a volunteer lobbyist with Humane Society, and I'm I'm always willing to talk to people, you know, about wildlife trafficking, and you know, I, I and if people want to help us with the bill, or if they want to contact their um, representatives, then I'm always willing to talk to people. Thank you. All right, Heidi, put her, put her email in. Thank you. Natalie, you have a question. Um, I was just wondering, like, what the laws are for the, like, the spiders and the geckos, like, when I go to PetSmart to buy cat litter, and I see a lot of, like, pet expos at um like Dulles Expo Center in Northern Virginia like are there I'm guessing those people have to declare the animals they have and like does that kind of exacerbate the issue of people buying reptiles and not knowing how to take care of them or like yeah I don't really know how to ask the question but like are there yeah <laughs> that's all I can. Let, me, let me attempt to answer your question um, all wildlife, including insects, are required to be declared to us. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, a lot of the things you see at the, at the expos are mm -hmm. bred in the U.S. So a lot of the tarantulas and spiders, some of them are, are, are bred in the U.S., some of them are, are imported into the U.S., um, the slings, if you know, are very difficult to identify when that's small, but they do import into the United States with proper permits. I'm not saying all of them are, but mm -hmm. they do come in and they do have permits for them. But a lot of, from what I know and, and, and in my experience, most of the people who are selling adults are at either imported them legally or have raised them from slings. And some of them have been bred in the US. And to follow up, is there any kind of education on like at these expos or at PetSmart saying like, this gecko isn't like owning a cat and maybe preventing people from maybe dumping the turtle they bought or dumping the gecko because they got bigger and don't know how to take care of them. That would so be that way the owner could be like, oh, maybe I won't purchase this that would be more on the private sector the people who are selling it versus the fish and wildlife service which we enforce the law and not the husbandry aspect and okay. that may be a usda question who do care account the bread wildlife mm -hmm. and are who are more apt to they're the ones who do the zoo inspections and the the sanctuary inspections yeah. where we do the permitting of the wildlife Thank you. And organizations like Matt and the Natural History Society of Maryland, who, um, whose mission is to educate the public on, on, to on topics like that and responsible husbandry. Katrina, do you have a comment to make? Okay, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, well, I, I have comments for the other two questions, but I'll, I'll get to those if there's time at the end. But I had a question about the Lacey Act. Does commerce, that is exchange of money or goods, is commerce always involved in a Lacey Act violation? No. So if, I, if someone takes a turtle from Louisiana to Texas to keep as a pet, like they find it crossing the road in Louisiana and take it to their home in Texas, is that a Lacey Act violation? Although no no trade has happened. Yes, if they didn't, if the, if the state requires you to have a license to 
obtain a reptile like Marilyn does, you need a fishing license for something to, oh. to have a turtle. <laughs> I think you. I think you do because I I read the regulations for turtles. If they Maryland allows you to have one native species of certain list with a permit. If you don't have that permit, you can't have it and you can't breed them in Maryland. It depends right. on the species. Right. That's what I said. Okay. List. It, it's a certain yeah. list. So um, no if one... that if that person <laughs> if it doesn't matter, no one regards that rule, but that's the law, right? So if the, you're, in your scenario, if someone didn't have a license to collect that species and transported it somewhere else, then it's a violation of that state's law. So it is a violation. It's illegally obtained, transported to another state. That's a Lacey Act violation. Okay. All right, the wording, yeah, the wording, oh, I said commercial, so I was just double checking. And, um yeah no you can't you can't collect anything from commercially from maryland but um uh also yeah I, I, the comment you made about the cites versus the esa the endangered species act the Podonymus genus down in south america decades ago they were added to the esa so that they wouldn't the imports from South America, the little tiny baby turtles wouldn't outcompete the native, I mean, the US turtle farms. So at the time, Podonymus wasn't endangered, but it was out of the ESA because someone knew a senator or something. And, and so. there's a mechanism to delist if, and, and the, the Federal Register, when the listing comes in, the co public can comment and suggest um, delisting or listing an animal. So that's the, the opportunity if you wanted to do list put it, um, put it in the comments section and they will respond because every one of those um, comments need to be reviewed and responded to. Uh, um, I don't, I don't want to delist those, but it's, it's just interesting how it was used at one point in time. Yeah, a lot of wildlife laws don't make any sense for conservation. <laughs> some of them do, some of them don't. So, you know, it's case in point, the sage grouse out in the West. Right, did you uh, know that so, scenario? Um, Shelly is asking a question How do the canine teams work, and what kind of teams are they? The canine team is basically a, a, a dog that we get from a rescue team, or a beagle or a lab, and they go to um, a facility in Florida, which also trains beagles for the Beagle Brigade in the USA and CBP. And it's a wildlife inspector and the canine together, and they train together. After the dog is trained by USDA to uh, detect certain scents. And then the inspector goes to the training center to train with the dog to um, train on those scents and then showing how to train the dog on other scents like wildlife. Um, we don't want our dogs to be going if you know the beagles they 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 go for food apples bananas and and meats and stuff we don't want them to hit on that stuff we want to hit on lions elephant ivory turtles so we we have those items and we train them on those items and they would cue on that in either mail facility on the person in the baggage area or in the cargo facility or on a boat hopefully answer the question I think so. And then, so um, with, with so few of your wildlife inspectors um, and so many ports of entry and, ex and, and, and egress and ingress, um, how, how are all, the, I mean, there's no way to, to, to look in every single box. And, and so the dogs, I think, help a lot, but is there a strategy that goes, that y'all are employing? Um, yeah. Uh, so. ESA is only, no, since 1973 when it started. And we, and our program started in um, maybe, I forget, but somewhere around the 80s when we, the inspection program really, really blew them up. And um, we've learned from now on to, to use our resources and our partners to a greater degree and also have uh, um, a risk assessment of, of things you want to look at and 
in, in the years we've we've learned where we should look and how things are coming in and you know adapt to all the changes once we look at one area and stop one one route if another one opens so we're doing that a lot of risk assessment a lot of um knowledge from past years and how how to look and where to look and where we're coming in and how do we best use our resources it's it's it's, it's not a it's not a how would you say that it's it's not something that we take lightly and we're we're glad that the community and senators and congress is now looking at it with with there's you no know, the wildlife diseases are coming through now it's becoming more heightened and they're and now they're realizing oh we we are we're doing an important job and, we, and they are seeing that we're doing an important job and and we're curtailing not just because they're endangered but it's also because the livelihood and protection of our na native animals plus people too at this point um, Lynn it says, are you using more eDNA? And because it is all is done in house or contracted, can't imagine 227 employees doing all of this work as well as other tasks. Um, the DNA that we use are specific to the crimes that, that we're looking at. So uh, we do have the forensics um, lab does do a lot of our um, criminalistics and the crime we usually use DNA for, for looking at crimes and, and, and identifying the animals for that crime that we're investigating. eDNA is, is a thing that, that, that's being looked at right now um, because of the, um, if you guys, you guys probably heard about the, the moss, bald and zebra mussels issue being sold at you know, pet stores that came in contaminated with moss balls. So we're looking into that as a, uh, with the invasive species uh, section of Fish and Wildlife, Aquatics and Conservation and USGS to, to make that more readily available to um, check for these uh, mussels in, in the water. But the eDNA is, is limited to the assays that are made for that specific DC species. So we can't make 100,000 assays to look for 100,000 animals, that would take too much long, but we do target what we can target. And that's becoming, eDNAs or uh, scanners are gonna be available to select few um, ports of entry where most of the aquatics are coming into the country. Um, I have a question also, what is, when you show that picture of somebody taping birds to their legs and hiding turtles in speakers, what is the most outrageous, I guess, uh, attempt to do that you that has been captured um, uh, in terms of trafficking illegally? Back in the 80s, there was, was a, a mom, um, 80s or 90s, I forget where the mom and, and daughter went to, to South America and wanted a monkey. So they drugged a monkey and um, got a prosthetic for the daughter as a pregnant woman and drugged the monkey and put it under the pregnant woman's um, belly. Um, that's that's the oddest one that come to mind. That's that's pretty odd. Uh, any other questions or comments on this evening? Yeah, Katrina, go ahead. I was just curious if you were uh, on the desk if you were the one that received the uh, the anonymous information about Dave Summers in New Jersey with the Diamondback Terrapins, no, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> that that could have came into a number of different ways. Uh, it could come through our uh, tip line on a website. It could come to the phone call. I don't remember how it was done or directly through a, a, an informant. Okay, I was really glad to see you guys get him. His, he, his name had been known as Shady for years. There's so. a lot of Shady people out there. <laughs> well, and that's a, and to follow up on that, Katrina, Pat, what is the best way if we, I mean, if we're dealing or not dealing, but come across anything that sounds unusual, when we see something unusual, we're out looking at herbs and we see somebody collecting turtles and, and it doesn't look right at all. What is our best course of action as just um, citizens, private citizens? First, I, I 
we, we don't want you to confront the person. Um, don't stay safe. Don't do that because you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know what people have nowadays. Um, you can, you can, if you can safely, you know, if they, you know where the car is, jot down there for the car information and you can either um, call my office uh, right now is in Richmond or you can go to online. We have a tips line on there. You can anonymously put in the information on there for us to look at. Um, or you can call the state um, game wardens and report them if, because they're they're going to be around more than we are. Um, and they may have someone in the area to respond to and check this person out. Um, so that's that's the best thing you can do is do that. But we but we don't want you to be citizen arresters because <laughs> you you don't want to be in that confrontation where you may get hurt or something like that. Right, and I I, assu I, um, I assume that it would be great to have more partners like us in the field. I mean, just just eyes and ears, not not out there enforcing things, but just um, looking where uh, you know, um, extending your search. Right, and and that that's and that's and that's the crux of, of a lot of things we get. Sometimes we get um, tips and and goes big, and sometimes get tips that that you know, aren't going anywhere because that person you're reporting actually has a permit and it's working with the state, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, what we, we don't want you to do is, you know, call us because a raccoon was, you know, some, in someone's garbage or in someone's house. I mean, we get that too. Um, but we forward that to the state or the local animal control, but we'd like to hear everything that you, you see, you know, Eagles, hawks, anything like that, wildlife, turtles, even foxes and, and coyotes who you think they're being hunted illegally or, or taken illegally. Uh, Paul has a question. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Uh, I mean, you, you've talked a bunch about, you know, like, like different examples of, you know, animals being collected here, the box turtles and things like that. And, and you know, yeah. Uh, Having Chinese students, you know, sending to to you know uh, probably like middlemen in China and things like that. I mean, I've seen a couple of the the I guess the you know media you know summaries of some of those, and sometimes it seems like the penalty is really light. And I know that's probably outside of Fish and Wildlife's control, but you know there you know when you talk about how much money is at stake with some of these, I mean there are. You know, a, if they can get, you know, a, a, even a percentage of those shipments to China, they can make hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, uh, you know, of, of every month. Right. And, you know, the penalties I've seen are in the tens of thousands and in the fifties of thousands. And it's uh, it just seems like it's not in line with, uh, you know, stopping, uh, you know, some of the behavior. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, 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 you're right. It is, it is minor and depend, it depends on um, where you are. It depends on the judge, the um, prosecution of where you are. We, you have to remember that we were going against um, cases from attorney general's office. I mean, the U.S. attorney's um, office of money laundering, um, pedophile, um, human trafficking, drugs, murders, where animal wildlife crimes are, we have to, every time we do a case, we have to make sure the case is solid and yep. we have to sell it to the judges to take these cases. And you're right, the, the, the amount that we get aren't as big as those other cases, even though the, the money is made from them are larger. Yeah. It's very difficult for, for us to um, sell these cases and get those fine of the penalties. But what we're trying to do is elevate that by going international and getting the people who are international. Mm -hmm. But when we do these big cases, um, I don't know if you remember a few years ago about the uh, striped bass case where commercial fisheries were taking illegal fish and that came out to be millions of dollars and we, we, we split that between the states that were um, affected by that way, mm -hmm. but it doesn't it doesn't 
make up for the loss of, of funds and the resources, but it does put a dent and does give an idea of, of, of why wildlife trafficking is such a big issue and, and needs to be dealt with. And we, we, we do it not just because um, it's the right thing to do, we do it for the, for the animals and, and we try to get the biggest um, penalty we can get. And that's dependent on the judge and the attorneys and, and how they want to handle the case, even though we have some say, yeah. it's not very big. If you see the um, collateral schedule we have for some of these violations, uh, collateral schedule means the, the, the minor stuff, the tickets that we, can, we send out. And this has to be agreed upon by each district of, of attorney's offices. And it varies differently from all the districts in the US. If, um, for instance, in Texas, if you kill, it illegally kill a deer, you can get $10,000 fine plus four years loss of your hunting license. In Virginia, you may be not getting that. You maybe get a $50 fine and loss of a year of hunting privileges. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of stuff. So it de depends barely on um, where you go and where it's, where it's happening. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Any other questions for um, Pet this evening? I don't see any more hands. And thank you so much for taking your time um, and sharing your experiences with us this evening. And uh, on behalf of the Natural History Society of Maryland and everybody here, thank you for all of the work that you do um, to help uh, protect our, our wildlife resources and ecosystems. Um, it's not an easy job and uh, we, we definitely appreciate um, all that you are doing and, and the rest of your team um, is out there doing as well. Um, any, other, any other questions? And if not, I would love for y'all to join us um, for in more programs. Just go to www.marylandnature.org to see what else is coming up. And um, stay safe, stay well, and uh, stay curious, everybody. Take care. Thank you, have a good evening. Thank you.